Hello, dear Sangha. Welcome, everybody. Um, I'm happy to be here with you all and to give my talk on uh, Buddha stories. Um, so the topic for today um, is stories of the Buddha and stories that I've heard on the path of meditation that I feel like can help to um, tune us into an element of life that is um, that we can access through our practice of mindfulness, um, one that is rooted in the present moment and that can bring us joy and understanding and kind of some straightforwardness in our lives. Um, so for the first um, story, I thought I would share a popular story known as the Zen farmer story. Um, and so the story goes like this. Um, there's a farmer in a rural province and he owns a flock of horses, a group of horses. And one day, one of the horses that he owns breaks out of his gate and goes running away into the forest, into the mountains and is lost. So after this happens, the villagers show up to the farmer's uh, farm and they say to him, um, your, your horse has ran away, your horse is gone. What bad luck you have. That's such terrible luck. And the farmer looks at them and he says, good luck, bad luck, who knows? And the villagers nod, they maybe look at each other and say, this guy's kind of crazy. And they walk away into the back into the village and next uh, a couple days pass and the farmer's horse actually comes back and it comes back trailing with it a young pony um, another young horse next to it and that they just walk right back into the farmer's pen and the horses are there and now the the farmer has gained this new young uh, pony along with his horse that he lost before and the villagers arrive again, and they say to the farmer, such good luck you have. Wow, you're truly blessed. You've really um, had a great turn of luck this time. Um, we're really happy for you. And the farmer looks at them, and he says, good luck, bad luck, who knows? And so the people nod again. They kind of retreat back away into the forest, into the village. And next, the next few days pass, and the farmer's son is riding the new pony and trying to break it, trying to um, get it under control and trying to um, make it rideable um, so that they can use it around the farm. And the pony throws him off, throws the son off, and the son falls down on the ground and breaks his leg. And the villagers come back in. And they say to the farmer, they gather around the farmer and they say to him, wow, your son's broken your leg, broken his leg. And it's also time to harvest the crops. How are you gonna do the work you need to do? That's such bad luck you have. You're in really bad straits right now. And the farmer looks at them and he nods and he says, good luck, bad luck, who knows? And the villagers retreat back into the village. Maybe some of us have these villagers in our own life. Maybe it's our in-laws that are talking about our life, or maybe it's a group of friends, or maybe it's our followers on social media that are quick to give us likes or dislikes or their opinions. Or maybe it's also a quality of our own mind that's constantly trying to judge and say, this is good, this is bad. I need to try to avoid this thing. So the farmer keeps going about his life his son's there with the broken leg. He's trying to find out what's happening. And then suddenly a large army storms into town and a few of the officers break off and they go around to every farm and they're looking for recruits for this large war that's being waged. And they need young men to come and fight the battles that they have, um, these gruesome battles coming up in their future. And the general comes into the to the farmer's farm and he looks at takes one look at the son's leg and he sees that his leg is broken 
And he says, unfortunately, we can't take your son to war. And the son's life is spared and the son retreats, the, the general retreats and the son stays. But the villagers come in once again and they take a look at the farmer's lot and they say, wow, your son was spared from being taken for the war. What good luck you have. And the farmer looks at them and says, good luck, bad luck, who knows? So that's the end of that story, the Zen farmer story. And I think that captures the quality of equanimity that we can have in our lives. Sometimes things are going well, and we can be grateful for those things. Sometimes things may not be going so well, but we don't have to um, lose our cool or lose our sense of groundedness and presence when things aren't going so well. We don't have to fall into a state of panic and say, my life is over. This is um, really not going well. Um, and this is really bad luck. Um, we can look at it and we can try to see what, what we can take out of it that can be beneficial and we can stay with the experience. Um, we don't have to jump into these quick categorizations of how things are, whether in our own lives, and we can also not practice not doing that with other people. When we see something that may not be the best of circumstances happening for another person, we don't have to automatically interpret it as bad. And we can also do the same when, when things are going well. We can inquire into how they're handling that, and we can just be present with it without judging, without um, just being open while, while just being open to what's, to what's happening. So I think the Zen farmer story is a story that can remind us to kind of pause and reflect when we're being really quick to put our lives into one category or the other. The second story that I wanted to share um, starts with a is is a story that the Buddha told that is kind of almost like a Zen koan. And a koan is a story that's told that the meaning may not be completely clear at first, but then once we contemplate it, and once we think about it a little bit more, we can see with more clarity what this story is trying to teach us, what it's trying to tell us. And so this story is, um, I'm not sure exactly what the name is, but I call it the tiger story with the berry. Um, and it goes like this. So I'm going to tell this story. And then after I'm going to pause and bow out and allow Sangha members to bow in and kind of share what their interpretation is of the story. Because you all also have Buddha nature, so you can interpret these stories as well and kind of bring out what, what um, gems you see in this story as well. So the way this story starts is there's a man or a woman walking through the forest. Um, it's a pretty peaceful day, just walking, um, not really anywhere to go or anything to do. And then suddenly, out of nowhere, a tiger starts chasing after him. And he looks back and sees the tiger, and he starts sprinting away from the tiger, running for his life. And then um, as he's running, for his life in survival mode and panic mode. He um, sees a cliff and he starts falling off this cliff. And as he's falling, he sees a vine that's dangling from the cliff. And on his way down, he grabs the vine and holds onto it for dear life, just dangling from the edge of this cliff, holding onto the vine. And he looks up at the cliff and he sees the tiger snarling down, looking at him, waiting for him to climb back up and reach the edge of the cliff so that the tiger can then eat him. And he looks back down the cliff and there's a long steep drop. And at the bottom of that cliff, there's three more tigers that are approaching the bottom of the cliff. So at this point, things are not looking good for this character in this story. The next thing that happens is there's a small little hole next to the vine, next to where he's gripping the vine, maybe a few feet above. And a small black and white mouse jumps out of the hole and comes up to the vine and starts nibbling at the vine, starts nibbling away at the vine. So we have the tigers above, the tigers below, 
and this mouse just slowly nibbling away at this vine that's not even that thick to begin with. So you can imagine the state of panic and fear that's arising in this person's mind, um, understanding that this is probably the end, this is probably not going to end well for me. And suddenly, as, as he's thinking this, he turns to the side and sees a bush of strawberries growing out on the side of the cliff. And the man plucks out one of the strawberries and takes a bite of it, and the strawberry tastes extremely sweet. It's a very delicious strawberry. And that's where the Buddha ends the story. That's the end of the story. We end with this, this person savoring the strawberry, the tigers above, the tigers below, and the mouse nibbling the vine. So I'm going to go ahead and bow out, and I'll allow you all, Sangha members, to bow in and share what you think your interpretation of that story is. What does that story mean? And maybe why did the Buddha tell that story to us? So I'll go ahead and bow out, and if you'd like, feel free to bow in and share. So um, the point of the story is that um, the tigers represent, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, back to real Nick. So the point of the story is that the tigers, um, actually, I just want to reflect on what you all said, is that suffering makes life sweeter. And many of us don't realize the preciousness, the importance, the sacredness of life until we're brought into such a sharp and almost treacherous situation of being about to die. Sometimes people go through life and they don't realize the preciousness and the beauty and the sweetness of life until they're on the verge of death. And at that point, yes, we can still savor life, but what about all the moments before that where we could have also been savoring life? I think that's what the practice of meditation takes us into. The Buddha often said, do not run after the future. Do not run after the past. The past is gone. The future has not yet come. The present moment is the only true place to touch life. And so I think that may be one thing that both of those tigers um, represent. Maybe sometimes we look back to the past and we think, Man, life was so good back then. If I could just get back to where I was in the past, if I could just be younger, um, if I could just be back in my childhood where I was kind of innocent, um, if I could just be back in that time where I was living in that place and things seemed to be going very well for me, we always want to look back to the past and get back to there. But in reality, we can see the past as almost like that lion. The more that we live in the past, the more it's eating away at our ability to actually touch the joy in the present moment. And it's the same with the future. We may have this ideal future. It's okay to make goals and make plans for our lives. But if we're living the majority of our life in our future in those plans, waiting for the next great thing to happen, um, even when we get there, there's still going to be some suffering. There's still going to be some difficulty. And if our minds are caught in that forward facing, always looking towards the future mode, then even when we get to the ideal that we're looking for, we're still going to be planning for something else in the future. We won't be able to touch the present moment and be there fully. So when I reflect on that a little bit more, I think the tigers can represent the past and the future. Um, and also just this general theme that um, being aware that we're going to die, being aware that our lives are limited, um, sharpens us and helps us to come back to the practice um, and devote ourselves to the practice, to, to, to awakening, to realizing those seeds of, of peace and love and joy. So that was the tiger story with the berry. I'm going to tell two, maybe three more stories. Um, and so the next story I wanted to tell is a story called the Golden Buddha Statue Story. And this one is about a group of monks who um, lived somewhere in the East um, in Asia, and they uh, had this beautiful Golden Buddha statue. 
that was um, in the center of their monastery. And one day they heard that um, there was a war that was sweeping in and um, soldiers were gonna come and plunder everything they could find. So they took a look at their golden Buddha statue and they thought um, it wouldn't be good if, the, uh, if these soldiers plundered the statue. So they uh, worked together and they began to cover it with clay and mud and all sorts of layers of clay and mud until all of the gold was obscured. And on the outside, it just looked like a kind of ugly mud covered clay Buddha statue. Then the monks then uh, left the area because they knew their lives were in danger. And the soldiers came in and they, you know, pillaged and slaughtered as soldiers do in villages. And um, the, they, they didn't touch the Buddha statue. They just thought it was this big, ugly statue and they just left it where it was. Now it's unclear what happened to the monks, but they weren't able to get back to the statue and uncover the gold of the statue. So what they did instead, or actually, so the monks passed away and no one knew that there was gold underneath the statue. One day, decades later, centuries later, the um, a new group of monks came and they centered their practice around that statue. Um, and one day, one of the monks was walking by and um, he accidentally scraped against the statue. Um, I guess he wasn't walking very mindfully. Um, even when I'm walking mindfully, I still sometimes scrape against things. Um, but when he scraped against the statue, a clod of mud fell off of the statue and he noticed that there is gold underneath the statue and he was astonished. So he gathered his other monks around him and they gradually bit by bit tore away at the statue, revealing its full gold. Um, so they tore away parts of the clay until all the clay was washed off and it revealed this shining golden Buddha statue. And so I like that story because it represents our own introduction to the practice. Um, when we listen to the Dharma talks, we often hear about those seeds of loving kindness, of peace, of compassion and equanimity, um, those qualities of radiance or divine abodes that we can practice, um, or the Buddha nature within ourselves, which represents the manifestation of wisdom and enlightenment. And we're told that everyone has the Buddha nature, that everyone has this shining golden Buddha essence within us. But when we come to our meditation practice in the beginning, at least, it's not clear maybe how to, how to manifest that, how to bring that about. And maybe we're covered with clods of dirt, which could represent, you know, our grief, our anger, our sadness, our depression, our difficult emotions, maybe our sense of regret, maybe our sense of anxiety about the future. And we're just covered over with all these things that we can't see with clarity that that beauty, that loving kindness, that compassionate heart that we all have within us. So I think the cleaning off of the Buddha statue represents our practice of meditation. It may take weeks to do this. It may take years to do this. It may take our lifetime to do this. But when we sit and practice, when we sit and practice dwelling in the present moment, we can experience some of those clods falling off bit by bit. Maybe we experience we're, we're stuck less in the past and we can really touch that beauty of the present moment. Maybe we experience more lasting calm and peace in our lives. Maybe we experience less, just less distraction, less being, being scatterbrained and, and all over the place. We can really be present with ourselves and with others and listen deeply to people. And so those qualities are there and they're available. And through our practice, we can get closer and closer to revealing more of who we really are, that Buddha nature on the inside. So I like that that golden Buddha statue story. Um, and it's something that I return to in my practice, that, that image. Um, and when we chant the four Brahma Viharas, um, Brahma Vihara Maitri, Brahma Vihara Karuna, Brahma Vihara Mudita, Brahma Vihara Upeksha, 
we're reminding ourselves that we have those elements of the Buddha nature and we're working on bringing those into our everyday life for the benefit of ourselves and other beings. So I'll share two more stories um, about the Buddha's life. I wanted to share this next one because Cornell played the flute for us so beautifully and it reminded me of the um, Buddha story um, with the flute. So I'm probably not getting these names right, the Buddha flute story. I don't think that's what it's called in the sutras, but um, if you look it up, uh, that's the Google, that's the Google um, name for it. And if you look that up, it will be accessible. Um, so I'm actually gonna read from this one online and it comes from Thich Nhat Hanh. And so in this story, um, the Buddha was sitting after his enlightenment under a tree and um, nearby him, uh, there, there were some men that had gone for a picnic in the woods, and they brought along a young lady who sang well to entertain them. And the story says, after the picnic, the young men took a nap in the forest, and during that time, the young lady stole all their valuables and ran away. When they woke up, they didn't see her, so they began looking for her. So you can picture these young men waking up and they're running after their possessions, um, similar to the, to, the, to the man in the beginning who is running away from the tigers. These men are running after this woman looking for their possessions, their valuables, the things that they think give them meaning in life. And suddenly they stumble upon the Buddha. And the Buddha said, young men, would you like to find the, the young lady or would you like to find yourselves? The young men were quite surprised. Looking for a young lady was understandable, but looking for themselves, what does that mean? The monk had said something provocative and they looked at him with great interest. The Buddha said, sit down, my friends. And he told them what it means to look for yourself. He told them that life can be found only in the present moment. If you look for it in the past, you sacrifice the only moment you are alive. Look, young men, look at the leaves under the effect of the sunshine. Aren't they beautiful? Suddenly, the young people looked and saw that the leaves on the tree are very beautiful. The Buddha said, if you look for something else and sacrifice the present moment, how will you see the beauty of these leaves? Please sit down and breathe with me as we look at these beautiful leaves. So just to pause there, it doesn't take anything fancy to bring us into the present moment. We can start to notice the beauty that's all around us. Just the sun shining on the leaf is enough to help us to be brought back to the present moment. And it's free as well. So these intelligent young men understood the point made by the Buddha. They sat quietly for some time, enjoying looking at the trees and the plants and listening to the birds. That was the first time in their lives they enjoyed such simple pleasures. Suddenly, the Buddha saw that the young man on his right had a flute. When the Buddha was young, he liked to play the flute. So he asked that young man, can you play your flute for us, my friend, Cornell? This was a surprise because no monk was interested in playing the flute, yet this monk was asking him to play. So he smiled, brought his flute up to his lips and began to play. And he played for close to half an hour and there was sorrow in his playing because the musician had a lot of pain in himself. After he finished playing, there was silence again and the Buddha sat down smiling, looking at his new friend. Um, Suddenly, the musician handed the flute to the monk. Now you play, he said. That aroused curiosity in the other young men. They expected that the Buddha would refuse, but the Buddha nodded and received the flute. Slowly, he brought it to the level of his mouth and he played. Everyone was impressed. Nobody had imagined that a monk could play the flute that well. It seemed that the bird stopped singing in order to listen to the flute and the wind and the leaves also. The entire universe became very still 
and everything and everyone listened to the Buddha's flute. At first, the sound was like smoke from an incense stick swirling up to the heavens, and then it became a stream of fresh water trickling down the mountain pass. Finally, it became a lotus flower with thousands of multicolored petals, the colors dancing with the sounds. Everyone was absorbed in it. People, everyone became the sound of the flute. The Buddha stopped and the young people were still with the flute. Silence was there for a long time. Finally, the musician asked, why is it that you play that flute so well? Who is your teacher? Can I become your student? I would like to follow you in order to learn to play the flute that way. The Buddha said, young man, if you want to play the flute well, you have to be really yourself. You do not, you have to go back deeply to yourself and reach the highest point of your spirit. If I play it well, it is not because I practice music a lot, but because I have returned completely to myself. When you're at your best, your art will be the best kind of art. When you are at your best, your art will be the best kind of art. So I'm going to pick up my guitar here and I'll be able to play Stairway to Heaven perfectly well because I've touched the highest level of my spirit. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I've reached that stage yet, but maybe someday. Um, I do think that we are all artists in some way. Some people say I'm not really creative. But in reality, when we look at our actions, when we look at our everyday life, every time we speak, we're creating something. Every time we look at another person, we're creating something. Every time we make eye contact with another person, there's a moment there of creativity, of generativity. And when we practice walking meditation, we start to see that an act as simple as walking is creating something. If we walk with anger and anxiety and sorrow, we're printing that on the earth. And when we practice creating peace and walking with peace with every step, we're printing that and creating that energy on the earth. And we can bring great joy into our lives through the practice of intentional mindful creativity. And when we practice our meditation, like the Buddha said, we can go in and touch our highest nature and we can practice bringing that out into the world for the benefit of beings, to inspire people, to help people. Maybe that goes hand in hand with finding a great teacher like Cornell to help you play the flute or to help you learn music. But I think learning any art form, maybe if we're really aspiring to create something beautiful with our art, um, I think my, my preferred art form is writing. And I can see that, that maybe the progress I've made through the practice is just as beneficial as studying the intricacies of grammar, or making sure that I'm modeling my story right according to the plot. Um, and so doing that practice, creating art, seeing ourselves as artists, as creative um, agents in the world is another benefit that comes from the meditation practice. So I think I have time for maybe one more story. Um, and this one is a little bit more brief, but I wanted to tie in a theme of the month of April since it's Earth Day. And as Bobby mentioned during our meditation, when we sit, we're sitting like the Buddha sat under the Bodhi tree. And there's a variation of the story of the Buddha sitting under the Bodhi tree where he goes and sits and he has this commitment that I'm not going to sit until I realize full enlightenment, or I'm not, I'm not going to get up until I realize full enlightenment. And this is after he'd been practicing for a long time. He'd gone through many different meditation paths and he still hadn't found the way. So he decided to sit under the Bodhi tree, under this massive hundreds of years old tree that had its own wisdom as well. So the Buddha goes to sit under the tree and in one rendition of the story, there's this character called Mara the tempter or Mara the evil one that comes to tempt him away from, from enlightenment that comes to try to take the Buddha away from his path of enlightenment. And I think that's, that's representative of all of our paths. I think everyone wants to realize more loving kindness, more peace. Everyone would like to be able to get up and meditate every day. 
But there's things that stop us from doing that. There's things when we have that commitment, there's things that are going to come along and try to test us and pull us away from that. So in the story, Mara, the tempter, tries to tell the Buddha, um, it's not worth it. You'll never be able to reach enlightenment. You won't be able to do it. And the Buddha continues to sit beyond that. And so Mara sends his three daughters to try to pull the Buddha away, pull the Buddha out of his, of his seat of enlightenment, of his spiritual search, and return back to his, to his old life. And the first temptation that Mara's daughters uses is um, manifesting different um, sensual um, aspects that try to pull the Buddha out of his state of peace. So when he's sitting, he's he's gone through the four, what are called jhanas, um, and he's reached this state of peace. And so these this sense of sensuality is trying to pull him out of um, being in this kind of unshakable state of peace. Maybe we can see that in our own practice where um, clinging to sense desires can sometimes pull us out of our state of peace and compassion and cause, um, cause us to wander from the path um, at times. And so the Buddha saw these sensual images rising up before him, and he continued to sit. He continued to stay in a state of peace. He wasn't pulled off the path. He wasn't carried away. And so the next thing is that... Um, Mara's next daughter came and presented this state of fear, of intense fear. And uh, she did that through bringing up these images of kind of the most gruesome wars um, that have happened. So all these arrows and maybe even going into the future, bullets weren't created at that time, but maybe bullets were flying at the at the Buddha. You can picture bazookas and um and tanks shooting at him. Maybe there's um nuclear warheads falling on the Buddha trying to shake him into this state of fear and saying, you need to defend yourself. You need to protect yourself. You need to go back to being a king like you were born and protect your nation from these, from these evils. And the Buddha continued to sit and he noticed that as the bullets, as the arrows came closer to him, they were actually transformed into flowers. The arrows were transformed into flowers. I think that's an important point in in the practice when animosity or anger or violence comes towards us and we can practice and stay in that state of calm tranquility not letting people walk over us and not just doing what people say but staying in that state of peace the energy transforms maybe we've all had the the um maybe some of us have had the experience of someone who's who's angry walking up to us and then we choose not to feed into their anger it can actually become transformed in some ways so that's a powerful little sign, those arrows turning into flowers. And the last, um, the last of, of uh, Mara's daughters came up and tried to tempt the Buddha using the um, aspect of duty. So they tried to guilt him into saying, you were born this great king and you left your family and you left um, the duty that society gave you and you're neglecting your duty as a person and that's how you're going to find your meaning and since you're neglecting that you're not going to be able to um, find your realization and you're going to have these negative consequences from it um, and back in that time um, duty represented something that was imposed on someone by society so the reason why the buddha left his palace one of the reasons why he left in the first place was because much of his life had been kind of decided for him before he was even um, born. Um, his marriage was arranged. Um, many of the tasks that he were that he was given as a ruler were set out for him um, before, and he didn't really have any choice. Um, but it was seen as as a great thing to do one's duty to society. Um, and, but the duty isn't really a free thing. It's something that's imposed. And the Buddha's searching for this almost deathlessness, this, this element of something that will persist and that will go beyond the kingdoms that arise and fall throughout all of history and the wars that create, that people create to protect their kingdoms throughout time and space. So the Buddha's looking for this higher compassionate vision than 
being a ruler than just fulfilling one's duties to society. Um, and gradually, as those visions came up, the Buddha um, stayed calm and he said, Mara, I know you're doing this. And he touched the earth. At the moment that he touched the earth, the earth shook and more flowers fell from the sky and trees bloomed out of season and a great flood came and washed away Mara. Um, that's kind of the archetypal story. In some renditions of the story, Mara does come back while the Buddha is meditating with his monks. And the Buddha then just gives Mara a seat at the table to sit with him and continues meditating while Mara is there. And Mara eventually stands up and goes. Um, and so I like that element of the Buddha touching the earth. And when we do the practice of touching the earth ourselves, it reminds us that the earth is also a bodhisattva. The earth is something that's helping us to awaken. When we look at the blooms of trees, when we look at every meal we eat coming from the earth, we can see the earth as this great being that's helping us on our path to awakening, that wants us to awaken as well. That's remembering the elements of compassion that we've tried to cultivate, that's remembered our secret struggles. So Earth Day is coming up. We can remember the earth. We can touch the earth with gratitude. And when we practice that mindful walking, we can see that the earth is supporting us and understanding us with each step. So those are my stories for today. Thank you all for listening. And um, again, all of those are open to interpretation, to discussion. Um, and I'm happy to hear what you all have to say um, about these stories. So I'll go ahead and bow out. And if you'd like to bow in, please feel free to share. So this is Nick bowing out. Thank you all for listening. <laughs>